Today's scripture is Psalm 69, verses 1 through 16, and can be found on page 565 in your pew Bibles. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the miry depths where there's no foothold. I have come into the deep waters. The floods engulf me. I am worn out, calling for help. My throat is parched. My eyes fail looking for my God. Those who hate me without reason outnumber the hairs of my head. Many are my enemies without cause, those who seek to destroy me. I am forced to restore what I did not steal. You know my folly, O God. My guilt is not hidden from you. May those who hope in you not be disgraced because of me, O Lord, the Lord Almighty. May those who seek you not be put to shame because of me, O God of Israel. For I endure scorn for your sake, and shame covers my face. I am a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my own mother's sons. For zeal for your house consumes me, and the insults of those who insult you fall on me. When I weep and fast, I must endure scorn. When I put on sackcloth, people make sport of me. Those who sit at the gate mock me, and I am the song of the drunkards. But I pray to you, O Lord, in the time of your favor, in your great love, O God, answer me with your sure salvation. Rescue me from the mire. Do not let me sink. Deliver me from those who hate me from the deep waters. Do not let the floodwaters engulf me, or the depths swallow me up, or the pit close its mouth over me. Answer me, O Lord, out of the goodness of your love. In your great mercy, turn to me. And may the Lord add his blessing to our understanding of these words. Welcome to Bethany Christian Church. There's a lot of places you could choose to be on a Sunday morning, but I'm glad you chose to be with us here. Thank you to those who are joining us on Zoom. Um, I hope somebody somebody else uh, walked over there and said hello to you this morning. Um, But this morning we're continuing our series through the Psalms. Um, And actually, I just got a nice announcement this week. Uh, Rev Bev is going to be closing out our series, so super excited for her to be preaching in a couple of weeks. But we took a little break last week for Father's Day and talked about David. But our first week, we talked about prayer. We had a reminder of what we talked about towards the beginning of our year this year, that prayer is primary. Because if we're not praying, if we're not doing this thing with God, I'm not really sure what we're doing. Then we talked about praise. Psalms are very well known for praise. They're very popular parts of the Bible as the Psalms of praise. But today, we're going to talk about Psalm chapter 69. And as many of you probably noticed, it's not much of a psalm for praise. It's a psalm for lament. So we're going to talk about lament today and the part it plays in the Christian life, in our lives, and what part lament plays in what we do here at Bethany Christian Church. So with that in mind, let us bow our heads in a posture of prayer, and let us pray. Lord, we come to you today, Thank you, thankful for the opportunity to continue exploring the Psalms that your servant David wrote. God, I ask that you would open the scriptures to us today, that you would teach us what each of us needs to hear, that we would be focused in to the words that you need to communicate to each of us individually today, that we would be we would be open to the prompting of your spirit and that you would teach us about lament. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be most pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I'll never forget the first time I heard a person wailing. By the time I had reached this point in my life, I'd been to at least a handful of funerals, including a close friend from growing up that had tragically died in a car accident. But at each of these funerals, whether it was my grandparents who had made it through several decades of life, or my good friend Zach, who had barely made it past age 20. 
At each of these events, I only heard soft cries, maybe some sobbing here and there, voices cracking while eulogizing, but never what I heard that night. It was a night shift at the hospital. You never really get great sleep on those nights because your body is always anticipating a wake-up call, a beeping pager, or the overnight trauma team springing into action in the call room beside you. I learned that some of us slept in our work clothes and some of us slipped into ours after the call came through. Me, I got dressed after the calls came through because it helped me to wake up before I got downstairs. On this particular night, it was 2 a.m. when I woke up to the familiar screeching of the pager. I rolled over and I rubbed my eyes before I picked it up. Trauma alert level one. GSW, room four, ETA, six minutes. I pulled my clothes on, and in the room beside me, I heard the trauma team scrambling to get their things together. And I followed a few seconds behind that night, catching a sight of their backs as the doctor in the PA slipped into the elevator before me. After they made it down, I, I called the elevator and I began reciting the St. Francis prayer. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. I finished the prayer as I rounded the corner to scan my ID at the back door to the emergency department. The doors made their familiar clicking sound as they opened. The CT room to my right made some beeping noises. That familiar rush of cold ER hair, uh, air hit me as I moved toward the manager of the department to check in. And I was surprised to find that he was less sarcastic that night. But he still swore as much as usual. He told me that a gunshot wound victim was on the way. He was talking with security because they were locking down the emergency department. Nobody in or out for quite a while. When the time came, the paramedics arrived providing active CPR to a man who was bleeding out from multiple shots from a gun. I stood back in the hallway and observed as the team worked to save him. And I watched for what was probably a few minutes but felt like a half hour or more. And all of a sudden I was interrupted from my tired trance by the department manager asking, where have you been? The parents are here. And then he shoved me into a room with a man, woman, and a police detective delivering the news that their son had been killed tonight. I moved to put my hand on the mother's shoulders as she cried into her hands. And I watched as this father started to convulse in fits of rage. And when, I, when he stood up, I thought he was going to put a hole in the wall. After a few minutes, they asked me to lead them outside so that they could get some air. And I had no idea what I was walking into, but there were at least a dozen people outside. But it's not the people that stick with me. It's the sound. It's the first time I ever heard wailing. In the psalm that we read together today, we heard a song of lament. We heard David's passionate expression of grief and pain. David cries out to God saying that he's sinking, he's drowning. His sight is failing him. His throat is tired and parched from calling out for help. He's been wailing. Overwhelmed by his circumstances, tired from calling on God for help with no one coming to support him, he has nothing left to do but lament. 
You know, contrary to what you might think, this kind of psalm, the psalm of lament, is actually the most common kind of psalm. It's the most common kind of psalm. These psalms of lament, songs of crying out to God in frustration, in desperation, in anger, in disbelief, these kinds of psalms, these songs of lament, outnumber the psalms that are known for praise, thanksgiving, and hope. I feel like for a lot of us, that's probably pretty uncomfortable to hear. You'd probably think it would be the other way around, right? I mean, I can't speak for you, but I know for me growing up in church, I feel like the message I've received most of my life was to smile through the pain. It wasn't like the example that this psalm gives us. And I think that this message of being cleaned up and squared away for church still persists, even when we don't think it does. We might say things like, church isn't a museum for the saints, but a hospital for the sinners. But I wonder, do we actually treat church that way? Do we actually treat church as a hospital for sinners, ourselves included? No, I wonder if the opposite happens. I wonder if sometimes we treat church as an escape from reality, as opposed to an embrace of reality. Following Christ's example, I think that we need to constantly evaluate whether or not we are embracing reality in all of the burdens that it comes with. Take, for example, what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a serpent being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now I'm going to give you the Landon Wilcox translation. If we were going to rewrite, rewrite this for today, maybe it would sound something like this. In our relationships with one another and those that we meet in the community, have the same mindset as Jesus have the same mindset as Jesus. While we know he was God, he did not use the, that fact to justify avoiding the pain of being a servant to all he came into contact with, even to the point of humiliation and a most painful death. No matter who you are or where you come from, whatever skill set you have or whatever skill sets you happen to lack, God can use you. I believe God wants to use each of you to further the ministry of this church in particular. I believe God will give you opportunities to invite members of our community to become members of Bethany Christian Church, new members who will bring their pain, their pain, new members who might cause us some pain, but they will help us grow, and we have the opportunity to help them grow. They will bless us, and we will bless them. They will love us, and we will love them. Sure, it's going to come with pain and discomfort. I can promise you that. We might lament, but that's what church is for. Church is for us to learn to serve people other than ourselves, and in turn, to be served by them. It's to be in intentional community with other people that are different from us, that come from different backgrounds, that look different from us, that have things to teach us. The prophet Ezekiel says this, you are to distribute the land among yourselves according to the tribes of Israel. You are to allot it as an inheritance for yourselves and the foreigners residing among you and who have children. You are to consider them as native-born Israelites. Along with you, they are to be allotted an inheritance among the tribes of Israel. This is the prophet's call to share with foreigners, to share with those who are outside of our four walls. 
Sure, it's a, share to, it's a call to share the good things, absolutely. But with the good things comes the responsibilities, the burdens, the lamenting, and the pain that we bring to the table and that they bring to the table. This is what we get to invite our community into. We are inviting ourselves, each other, and our community to do life together. And life together is messy, but I think it's worth it. I think it's worth it. And I think it's exactly what God has called those who call themselves Christians to do, to be an intentional community. So take this as a challenge, but also take it as a reminder, a challenge to reach out, a challenge to serve, a challenge to get uncomfortable, to get messy, but also a reminder that you too have permission to be human. A reminder to ask questions like, do I feel like a burden to everyone when I'm going through a hard time? Am I hiding my pain so that people don't feel uncomfortable? Am I afraid to risk being vulnerable, even with the people that love me? When God calls me to, am I afraid to invite the vulnerable into our church, into my home, into my life, or the life of this church? In the text we read today, verses 8 to 12, David says this, I am a foreigner to my own family, a stranger to my own mother's children. For zeal for your house consumes me, and the insults of those who insult you fall on me. When I weep and fast, I must endure scorn. When I put on sackcloth, people make sport of me. Those who sit at the gate mock me, and I am the song of the drunkards. Ask yourself, am I David, or am I like the people that are making David feel like an outsider? Maybe sometimes we're both. When I stepped out of the emergency department to encounter the wailing and the chaos of the dozen or more family members mourning the death of their son, their brother, their uncle, their cousin, I had no idea what I was going to do. I had no idea what I could do. By all measures, our culture would teach you that I had no business supporting this family. I was a 25-year-old that got mistaken for a teenager by a whole lot of people. I wasn't the same ethnicity as these folks. I'd never experienced having a family member who was shot in a gang shooting. I could go on to tell you all the ways in which people would tell me how I wasn't qualified that night but it doesn't matter. The only qualification I needed was God's. I only needed God's and my willingness to serve and love the people in front of me. And my friends, those are the only qualifications any of us need. Let that sink in. For all the night that that pain caused me, <laughs> for all the pain that that night caused me, <laughs> I can honestly tell you that in the end, I was blessed by it. Because I got the wonderful and terrible privilege to cry with a family that was lamenting. The final breath of our brother in the ambulance was the end of his earthly life, and so we wept together. We stained each other's shirts with our tears. And cried out to God. We said, do not let the floodwaters engulf us or the depths swallow us up, 
or the pit close its mouth over us? Answer us, Lord, out of the goodness of your love and in your great mercy, turn to us. Amen.